The Bible says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Crooked thinking is crowding our thinking. Think about it. Crooked thinking about sin is just sinful. Crooked thinking about the Word is growing worse. This is why in Genesis 1 through 11, we have these foundational truths that will equip us and encourage us and enable us to straighten out our crooked thinking. I guess you set your clocks back, right? You wish you could set it back 20 years? Wish you could set your bathroom scales back 20 pounds, maybe? I was a little surprised by the response I got from the question. I sent a question out, you know, which do you prefer, fall back Sunday or spring forward Sunday, you know, and I thought everybody would respond like somebody did. One person sent in and said, duh, fall back, right? Like, why are you even asking the question? But surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, fall back was the most number one response. However, it was very close. 53% or so said fall back. The Sunday we fall back. 40% said the Sunday we spring forward. 7% said neither one, just pick one and leave it alone, right? But here's the reason people gave for fall back. That was the extra hour of rest, right? (laughs) You know this extra hour where you just lay awake in bed dreading getting up? (laughs) That extra hour of sleep? Yeah. We don't rest very well, do we? We, Rest is so elusive. It's so uh, uh, slippery. It's so uh, difficult to find. And so today as we come to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, verse 1, 2, and 3, I want to speak to you on the subject, the rest of creation. Now, in Genesis 1, we have the six days of creation, and God looked, saw everything he made, he said, it's very good, okay? Now, that creation of man was the apex of his creation, the pinnacle, the height of his creation, but it wasn't the conclusion of it. The conclusion of it comes here in Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to read the text. You follow along, all right, church? Here we go. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Amen. Father, would you help us? Holy Spirit, would you guide us as we respond to your word in Jesus' name? And all God's people said... Amen. All right, so here, here, here we go, church. Here we go. Let, let, let's think about rest for a moment. And I guess the big idea, takeaway, would be God's rest, it never rests. It never ceases. It never stops. It's ongoing. Okay, God's rest never rests. And several reasons we can say that we can make this statement based upon these three verses. And the first one is rest was made by God. God made rest. He created rest. I mean, you would think when when you read this, you might think to yourself, okay, chapter 1 is done, right? Creation's very good. Everybody's in place. The stage is set. We're about to see the, the, the life of humanity, this drama unfold before our eyes and We're going to see the creatures and all their unrest. And you would think, bam, here comes the the play of life. And the curtain rolls back and bam, there we are. But not so fast. (laughs) The first thing we read about when creation is finished is not the unrest of creation, but rather the rest of the creator. It's a fascinating little section of text here that... You know, quite honestly, I I did a lot of research on these three verses. I tried to find some, you know, what other people had said about them. And that's part of my study through the week. And I couldn't find much on these three. (laughs) Doesn't seem to be a lot out there on these three. We just, 
We just kind of skip over a text like this. And we don't really pay much attention to it. And we just kind of add it. I saw a lot of guys would just add it to chapter 1 and just kind of skip over it. But man, it, it does our soul good, our heart good to reflect on the rest of creation. And the fact that God made rest. So you say, well, why did God create rest? Why did God make rest? Was God tired? Was he worn out? Was he whipped? Was he spent? Did he hit the snooze button? I mean, did he need some Z's? I mean, what's going on here? Is he out of gas? Is he on his last leg? Is he burned out? Did, did he need an extra hour of sleep on the first Sunday in November? I mean, what's going on with God here? Why did he make rest? Did, did he need a breather? I mean, what's going on here? Is he burned out? Is he, does he need to lie down? Is he dead tired or dog tired? Is he dragging? No, no, he didn't grow tired. He's not worn out. He's not wiped out. God's not tired. He made rest because creation was finished. <laughs> it was just done. There was nothing more to do in regards to creating creation. It was finished. It was complete, it was accomplished, it was done. And so the Bible says, thus the heavens and the earth were, somebody say it, finished. Say it, church. Finished. All right, in the Hebrew, the original language, you know, in English, we put our subject, oftentimes, before the verb, right? Well, in ancient text, in the Hebrew language, it, it, what we have here is the verb is in the front for emphasis, so it literally reads, if you just took the Hebrew and read it, and they were completed, the heavens and the land and all the host of them. So the verb is in the front for emphasis, finished, complete, done. It's almost as if you can hear at the close of creation, they are finished. Just as we heard at the close of redemption, Jesus cry out, to tell us thy, it is finished. It's almost the same here. Creation is done. It's accomplished. God has set out. And here's the beauty of it. God is satisfied with it. He's content in it. Nothing more needs to happen for creation to be created. God is pleased and he is satisfied with it. Incredible te text of, of scripture here. In fact... Jesus, uh, the Bible says about Jesus in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. In other words, everything that was made was made in the beginning. Everything that was created was created in the beginning. All of it. The heavens and the earth. Speaks of everything. Space and matter. The heavens deal with space. The land, the earth deal with matter. And, and Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, here in Genesis 2.1 it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. So that means not only did God finish the forming of the heavens, the forming of the earth, the forming of the sea, but he also finished the filling of the sea, the filling of the land, and the filling of the heavens. All of creation done, finished, completed. By the time you get to Genesis 2, verse number 1, it's all finished. You know that feeling of accomplishment you get when you finish something? You cut the grass. I mean, isn't that just, <laughs> I did it. And that fresh smell of cut grass. Arr. Or you finish a, a paper you, that you're writing. What a, what, a, what a feeling of accomplishment. It feels good. Or you bake a cake. That could not only feel good, it could taste good. Couldn't it? When you finish something, it feels good. It feels good when you graduate with a degree or when you get your driver's license. Brady just got her driver's license. I don't know if I should be concerned or not. I don't know. But a feeling of accomplishment. Yes. Well, here, can you imagine how God felt? 
I mean, he, you can almost see how he feels when he says it's very good. Oh, it's very good. And it may, I mean, here's God Almighty finishing all of his creation. And what that means in verse 1 when it says the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, this is what that means. That Adam and Eve, they were, they were complete. They had two, two arms, two legs, right? Two legs to walk with God in the cool of the day, two arms to work in the garden, two eyes to see the beauty and all the sights, two ears to hear all the incredible sounds, one mouth that we still haven't figured out how to keep shut, one heart to pump blood, one digestive system to digest food. They were finished. They were complete. It means all the animals were complete. A horse had four legs. In Genesis 2, 1, he had four legs. All of creation complete. So this is what this one verse, the power of God's word. Don't underestimate the power of God's word. This one verse is the verse that delivers a death blow to evolution. Evolution is destroyed right here. It is finished done evolution is the complete opposite evolution is evil evolution says nothing is finished God says it's all finished Ray Comfort said it like this he said to believe evolution all you need is a big imagination a small brain millions of years and the word perhaps in reality, nothing evolved or is evolving. It was all created by the genius of God, and everything is complete. It is finished just as the Scripture says. So for me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take God at His word. I don't know about you, but I'm taking Him at His word. Here's further evidence that it was finished. If you'll look again at verse number 2, and on the seventh day God finished His work. Okay? That he had done. Please, please, please pay attention to that. God finished the work that he had done. He finished his work that he had done. In other words, God is the one who created all of creation. <laughs> no, 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 other, no, no one else participated in that. God did it all. Okay? That's important. Put that in the back of your mind. We'll get back to it later. God did all the work. Important. But then it says, look what it says, and he rested on the seventh day. So the fact that he rests is further evidence that creation was finished because there's nothing left to do. He had done it all, and he was satisfied with it. The word is Shabbat. The word rested is Shabbat. And it literally means to stop, to cease, to desist. To stand still, it means to delight in, to worship. Rested. means to cease from his work. He ceased from his work. He didn't need a breather. His work was completed. And so he ceased from his work. And when God, he didn't think, he didn't have these thoughts like we have. Like you and I, you and I have these thoughts all the time. We finish something, we think, man, what if I'd have done this differently? Or what if I'd have done that differently? Or what, what if I approached it this way or that way? God didn't have any reservations, no concerns, no worries, no doubts. Totally satisfied. Totally content with his completed creation. That's hard for us to do, man. This is why it's hard for us to rest. It's hard for us to lay our pillow, our head on the pillow at night and rest because we are rehashing the day. And we're rehashing that conversation and this conversation. And we're rehashing how we could have said that or maybe said that or done this differently, done that. And we rehash the whole day. And, 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 and we don't rest. I, I don't rest very well on Sunday nights. Now, it's not because I'm not tired. I'm tired. But I don't rest very well because I'm rehashing the sermon. Well, I should have, this should have said that. I uh, might have, shouldn't have said that. Or could I have said this? Or would I have said that? Or all these rehashing. All. And, and, and the times that I do rest well on a Sunday night is when I can lay my head on the pillow and rest in the fact and know that God's Word is working. Despite me, what I say or don't say, when this word is spoken, the Holy Spirit takes it and God's word is working. 
And that's how we can rest. Knowing that his word is not in vain, it will not return void. God is still working. Yes, he ceased from his work in creation, but he's still working. That's what you need to understand. He's still working. Jesus said in John 5, as the Pharisees, the Jews, are just persecuting him because he healed a man on the Sabbath day. He said, take up your mat and walk. And, and this crippled man, now healed, tells the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And so the Jews are persecuting him. This is what Jesus says, my father is working until now, and I am working. So God is still working not in creation, that's finished. But he's still working. Philippians, I mean, how, how many texts can we quote? Paul says in Philippians 1, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Hey, God finish. He finishes what he starts. <laughs> you can rest assured on that. He will bring to completion this work he's begun in you. It is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Psalm 121, incredible psalm. The psalmist, thinking about the one who made heaven and earth. This is what he says. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. He, he shall not strike you by day. No, no, the, 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 the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in, both now and forevermore. He's working. And because God has completed the work of creation, we can trust and we can know that he's completed the work of redemption, salvation, but also that he's completing the work of sanctification. We can know this because now, even now, even in this place, even sitting under the, the teaching and preaching of Genesis 2, 1, 2, and 3, right now, we can know that God is justifying by His grace. He is sanctifying by His Spirit. He is, he is sustaining by His power. He is governing by His providence. And he is keeping by his promise. Meanwhile, we can rest assured that his rest never rests. God's, God's abiding with you means that he will never abandon you. Hello? <laughs> he will never abandon you. His blessings never burn out. His calling never calls it quits. His counsel never cancels. His deliverance never underdelivers. His eternal rest never runs on empty. His forgiveness never runs on fumes. His faithfulness never fails. And his forever never falls short. He, he made rest. So you can trust him. He created it. He made it. This is how we know his rest will never end. Now, secondly, the way we can know this is not only did God make rest, but rest was made for man. God made it. But he made it for you and me. Rest was made for man. Rest was made for men, women, boys, and girls. Thomas Edison said it like this. He said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. You know, when I entered the doctorate program in 2008 at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, I soon realized I was over my head, out of my league. You have to take an exam to get in, an entrance exam. Then halfway through, you have to take a qualifying exam to stay in. Then you've got to take an exit exam to get out. So I said, that's three chances for them to kick me out. Because I got in there, and I looked around, and these guys, I was in there, they're, they're brilliant. I mean, just brilliant. Like, on a whole other level. They were highly intelligent. A lot smarter than I ever, and I told Dr. Barlow, my chair at the time, I said, Dr. Barlow, I'm, I'm out of my league. I made a 22 on the ACT. These guys made like a, like a 32 or 42, and you can't even make a 42, and they made it. <laughs> I mean, they're brilliant. 
And he looked at me and he said, you just don't give up. Don't give up. And it was amazing to just see what would happen to these guys. I mean, they, were, they had all the smarts, but they had no sweat. They had no perspiration. They dropping like flies out of that program. Not because they weren't smart enough. They just didn't want to do the work. And I'm bullheaded enough and stubborn enough and don't give up that I got by God's grace he allowed me to finish. And I'll, I'll never forget Dr. Barlow telling me that. And I'll never forget finishing and thinking, man, they, they really messed up. <laughs> but because of that drive, I don't rest very well. It's a problem, and I own it. I don't rest. My, my mind won't stop. My, my soul doesn't rest well. I'm, I'm just, I just, ha- I struggle with this. I can remember growing up. My, my mother was a preacher's kid. My grandfather was a Methodist preacher, and he preached three services every Sunday at three different churches, and mom would have to go with him and listen to the same sermon three different times. And then they'd go home and they'd have to take a nap all afternoon. And she did not like Sundays. In fact, and this was when she was a child. She, she in, in fact, vowed that she would never take a nap again. And I promise you, growing up, we never took naps. I attest to that. We were always on the go, all the time. And she, she'd, she'd say, go outside. Now, you remember this. Go outside. Don't come back inside till it's dark. I don't want to see you. I mean, you can be injured, come dragging in, say, she say, rub some dirt on it, walk it off, right? I, I believe, I, I really, I really, I do, I think one time I actually died. <laughs> and she said, walk it off, you're not coming in the house. We never rested, on the go all the time. And now the older I get, the more I need rest. I mean, I need, the older I get, I need rest from resting. I need to recuperate from recuperating. And that's God's plan. There's a reason it's God's plan for you and I to rest. He's he's established this. And he's put it in God's word for a reason. And yes, this is creation rest, but it led to Canaan rest. It led to the to Sabbath rest, it led to conversion rest, and ultimately it leads to forever rest in Him. Sure, it leads to that. It's not all packed in here, but this is the foundation of rest and having a day set aside to worship and to rest. And that's what this day is all about, worship and rest, the seventh day, the Sabbath day. And God was so satisfied with this day that he blessed it. Now, God has blessed Adam and Eve. He's blessed the other creatures. And as he's blessed them, they were fruitful and they multiplied, right? And so we too, spiritually, we're to be fruitful and we're to multiply. And I know how it is in your busy week. You're busy. And sometimes your time with God gets squeezed out. And you miss it on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And and you don't get that journaling in, or you don't get that time with the Lord in. Well, the Sabbath day is a day to catch up with God. You know, it's like, hey, if you love somebody, you spend time with them, you catch up with them. That's what the Sabbath day is for, a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of reflection, a day of rejoicing in the resurrection of Jesus, a day of recognizing what God is doing and celebrating that with fellow believers in Christ. As we gather corporately for worship and in life groups, it's a a day for that. And this seventh day was set apart from every other day. It doesn't just say it was holy and set apart. It was different. Day one through six had that phrase, and God said. That's not on day seven. Because God's creative voice didn't need to be spoken here. His creation was done. Day seven didn't have another day correspond with it. Like day three, when God formed the land... Day six, he filled the land. Day three and day six correspond with one another. Right? Well, day seven doesn't have a corresponding day. It stands alone. It's set apart. It's holy. It's repeated three times here. You can read it. Seventh day, seventh day, seventh day. Three times. The other six days are not repeated. They're mentioned one time. He, there's no evening and morning the seventh day. There was for day one through six, 
But the seventh day has no end. Indicates this rest continues. It's ongoing. That, that rest is not in a place. Rest is in a person. It's not some ritual rest that we have. It's real rest in a person. And so this rest is for you and for me. And so in blessing the Sabbath day, God made the Sabbath day a blessing. It's the only day of the week that is blessed. You say, okay, now I understand why Monday is not a blessing because God didn't bless it. Well, no, Monday is not a blessing because it's Monday. Right? But this day is blessed. It is set apart. And so here's some questions. Here's some things that are real practical that we, that we need to think about when we think about observing the Sabbath. Okay? What does that look like for us today on this side of the cross? Well, what is the Sabbath for? That's a good place to start. And what it's for is rest and worship. That's what it's for. To cease, to stop, to delight, to worship. Isaiah said it like this. To the people of Israel... In Isaiah 58, he said, If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, if you honor the Sabbath, if you honor it, not going on your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, verse 13, or binging Netflix, or keeping up with fantasy football. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not there. <laughs> if you honor it, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I'll feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. So Israel, under the law, was bound to keep the Sabbath according to the Mosaic law. But what about us today? Has that changed any? Do we still observe the Sabbath? Yes and no. If you, if you and I lived in colonial America, we would be guilty of, break, uh, of Sabbath breaking. Colonial America, that they, uh, that they took it very seriously. And man, we've come a long way. Maybe not for the best, but we've come a long way. Because if, if we did, if we acted like we do today in colonial America, then we'd be in jail, all of us. We'd be locked up in the stocks with our arms and our feet out for public humiliation as we, many of, I mean, we've all traveled on, the, on Sunday. We've, we've cut the grass on Sunday, watch football on Sunday. We shop and travel, all these things. And in colonial America, boy, they would, ha they would have had cardiac arrest if they were here today watching what we do. However, how do we observe the Sabbath? So think about it like this. Seventh-day Adventist and Seventh-day Baptist are very strict and say that Christians must strictly observe Saturday as Sabbath as ordained in creation and under the Mosaic law. That's one view. The second view that we have is from the Westminster Confession and others that say, hey, we have transferred Sabbath to Sunday because Sunday is the day Christ was resurrected. Amen. <laughs> Sunday was the day that the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Sunday was the day that the early church would gather together, break bread together. Sunday was the day that John the Revelator received the book of Revelation. And so we, we fall somewhere between the second view that the Sabbath is, we, we've transferred it to Sunday, and the third view is, well, we're no, under, on, we're no longer under the law, so we don't need to pay any attention to the principles of the Sabbath. Well, hold on a minute. We're somewhere in between those two. So how should we observe the Sabbath? Let me give you a, 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 a quick, I can't cover it all in our time together, but let me give you a quick observance of scripture what i would say is how we need to observe the sabbath number one don't observe it legalistically don't be legalistic about it god looks at our heart he doesn't look at the outward appearance of man the, the rules that the jews set up um, to follow many of them they took great pride in keeping them and we're prone to do the same thing as Jesus was constantly in conflict with the Pharisees about healing on the Sabbath, and they took it just to an extreme. The Sabbath is not for a list of do's and don'ts to be legal. Legalism never leads to godliness, so don't be legalistic about it. Martin Luther said it like this, If anywhere the day is made holy for the mere day's sake, if anywhere anyone sets up its observance on a Jewish foundation then I order you to work on it 
ride on it, dance on it, feast on it, do anything that shall remove this encroachment on Christian liberty, end quote. Now, the book of Colossians says it like this. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So, how are we to observe the Sabbath? Do it joyfully, not legalistically. Man, celebrate it. Reflect. Rejoice. Worship. Rest. Absolute. You have the liberty in Christ to do that. So do it well. And do it joyfully. Set aside that day for you and your family. And rest and worship. And on Sunday, gather with God's people. And worship and reflect and rest. All of God's creation rests. Man, the trees rest. Animals rest. The leaves rest. Winter rest. Summer rests, fall rests, spring rests, the sun rests, the moon rests, Reba McIntyre rests. She had doctor's orders to stop her tour and rest her, has vocal rest, so that's what she's doing right now. All of creation, rest. Spurgeon said it like this, a calm hour with God is worth a lifetime with man. We tend to have more, it's funny, isn't it? We tend to have more recreation equipment today, more leisure time than ever before in human history. And we're burning like two light bulbs just on both ends. I mean, we're just whipped. No rest in sight. Isn't it fascinating? So God has instructed us to rest in Him. Rest assured that God's rest never rest. God's grace is never out of gas. God's goodness never goes bad. His greatness never gets old. His hope never takes a hike. His love never leaves. His mercy never misses. His omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence never are they out of order. God's pardon never plays out. So rest. It's for you. It's for me. It's a gift from God. So enjoy it joyfully. Spend time with God on that day. And spend time with God's people on that day. All right, here's the third one. How do we know God's rest? Rest, or never rest. Thirdly, rest is found in the God-man. So rest was made by God, it was made for man, and it's only found in the person known as the God-man. Man's perfect God and God's perfect man the God man, the one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. He is where we find our rest in the person of Christ. You know, when God says something, He means it, church, and He means what He says. Do you believe that? Do you believe that He says what He means and He means what He says? Now, we don't do that very well. You invite somebody to something. And and they say something like this. Well, I might come. Let me translate what that means. They're not coming. (laughs) Or they say something like, well, I'll let you know. Again, they ain't coming. Or they say, I'm not sure yet. Oh, they're very sure they ain't coming or they say let me think about it they ain't gonna think about nothing they ain't coming or I'll try they ain't gonna try nothing they ain't coming we oftentimes we don't say what we mean and we don't mean what we say but I promise you God means every word of what he says and he says every word he says he means it and so here we go I want you to see what God says in verse 3 of Genesis 2, what does the word of God say? So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That word means he set it apart. And then look at this. Because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, God made the day holy, we make it unholy. Why? Because we're broken, we're a mess. Our greatest problem on earth is not... Who's 
in the House and who's in the Senate or who's in the White. That's not our biggest problem. Our greatest problem on earth is lostness. People are lost and without Christ, they don't have any rest. They're a mess. We're a mess. I'm a mess. You're a mess. Our sin is the problem. God made it holy. We make it unholy. But notice what this, how this text reads. Now, don't miss this. God rested from all his work that he had done. The end of verse 3. That he had done in creation. So all means all. Right? All means all of it. All his work that he had done in what? Creation. creation. Not in redemption. Not in justification. Not in sanctification. But in creation. So that work is finished. It was finished 6,000 years ago. It's done. Okay? But he's still working. This is why Jesus says, come to me. Not come to Buddha. Not come to Muhammad. Not come to religion. Not come to your works. Not come to your good deeds. Not come to your good pedigree. Not come to good advice. Not come to good vibes. Come to me. Come to a person. Come to Jesus. For he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Conversion rest. Then he says, you take my yoke. After you're converted and you belong to him, take his yoke. Learn from him. He is gentle and lowly in spirit, and you'll find rest for your souls, that sanctifying rest. It's all found in one person, and that person is Jesus. He says, come to me. Now, we know as we read on through Scripture that God's people were invited to enter rest. Israel was invited to enter the rest of the promised land. To enter the land of milk and honey. To find rest in that land. The rest of Canaan. To enter into that land. But so many of them refused and rejected and did not enter in. In fact, the author of Hebrews writes about this. This is not the rest of creation. This is the rest of Canaan. And furthermore, the rest of conversion, we could call it. But first he deals with the rest of Canaan and said, Hey, uh, enter, in, strive to enter the rest of God so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And what he's talking about, as the author wrote earlier in chapter 3, is they refuse to enter. Because of disobedience, the people of God refuse to enter the promised land. They refuse to enter the rest that God had provided for them. And so the author of Hebrews now says, Listen, there is a rest That remains, it's a Sabbath rest, and it's for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. What does that mean? Strive to enter rest. Labor to rest work to rest what does that mean well here's what it means before you came to faith in Christ if you're a believer before you were saved you were working very hard to please people you were working very hard to work your way into a right relationship with God you were working very hard to work your way into heaven you were working really hard on doing things good and right and trying to earn your way into the favor of God. Well, that's not how we're saved. (laughs) We're saved by grace alone, unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor alone, not by work so that no one may boast. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Alone. So what the author of Hebrews is saying, that those of you who have entered into the rest of God, that have entered into God in this relationship, and you're in a right standing with God, you're at peace with God because of the work Jesus did, not the work you did, 
You can't work your way in that right relationship. But because of the work Christ did on the cross and by way of grace and your faith, you are now in a right standing with God. And those who have entered into God's rest, you have rested from your works of trying to work your way into that rest. You can't enter that way. You must strive to enter by grace alone through faith alone. You'll never be good enough. You'll never earn it or deserve it. You strive. That's why he says strive to enter that rest. Strive to to not strive. Labor to not labor. Work to not work. But just rest in this salvation that Jesus came and lived a sinless life and died on the cross for your sins and mine. And they buried him and he was raised from the dead. And he is alive and he holds the keys of death in Hades. And he invites everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. So enter that rest. Strive to enter that rest. And and let let me say this. Listen. If you look at Genesis 2, 1 through 3, and you say, I'm a proponent of evolution. I'm I'm, I'm a support. I'm in support of evolution. Which means nothing is finished, right? There's still work to be done in creation. If you hold that view that creation is not complete but there's still work to be done in creation, then you must also hold to the same position on salvation. If you believe the work of creation is not complete, then you must also believe that the work of salvation is not complete. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because only Christ said it is finished. It is done. It is accomplished. The the work of redemption is finished. It is done. And here's the beauty of it. God was satisfied. God was content. He was pleased with the work at creation. And praise God. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. And God is satisfied. And he's content. And he is, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Jesus. Listen to him. He alone saves. He alone has come so you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. Give your life to him. Corey Tim Boom said it like this. You look around and you'll be distressed. You, you look within and you'll be depressed. But you look at him. You look at Christ and you'll be at rest. Oh, yes. Look to him. Let's not be like what Tim Keller said, that we tend to base our, our justification on our sanctification instead of our sanctification on our justification. In other words, we base our works after we're saved a lot of times. See, we're saved by faith alone. But in Christ, our faith is never alone. Works always accompany our faith. But Tim Keller's point is, hey, don't base the fact that you're saved on how you're living after the fact you've been saved, but base the fact that how you're living for Christ after you're saved on the fact that he saved you. He did the work. It was his work. Just like God rested from all his work that he had done in creation, God has rested from all his work that he has done in salvation. It's finished. So rest in him. I'd say this to every believer. Look, we have liberty in Christ. So if we disagree on some things when it comes to the Sabbath, and there's some of us that say, hey, I don't have to keep that strict observance of the law, but others may say, man, I'm going to keep the Sabbath under the Lord. And if they're in Christ, they have the liberty to do so. So let's be kind to one another. Let's not beat up one another. Let's be kind to one another. And if you're an unbeliever, I can't give you a better invitation than Jesus's. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest.